part. If you will, take your Bibles this morning and turn to Luke chapter 2. I saw many of you out there swaying as we sang that song. Doesn't it kind of just have a camelback rhythm to it? You just kind of just visualize yourself. That's, you saw me up here trying not to dip or sway too much. It might make you nervous out there. And pastor's got a little too much rhythm today. If you will, Luke chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse number 8. And I'm sure you've thought of this truth as well, but sometimes it's a shame, isn't it? We only hear these songs for a few weeks out of the year. Some great doctrine and truth found in them. And I hope already you've been encouraged through the singing of these songs together. Luke chapter number 2, we're going to begin in verse 8 and read down through verse 20. If you're able to do so, if you would join me in standing out of respect for God's Word, we're going to read uh, these verses together. Luke chapter 2, and let's begin in verse uh, number 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in their field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, verse 9, visualize this, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this should be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, as if that was not enough, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. It came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Verse 16, They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made note abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. This morning for a few minutes, we want to look at this subject together. We've been looking at lights in Luke, and specifically in the Christmas narrative, and today looking at the light of testimony, the light of testimony. Let's pray and let's ask God to help us today. Father, thank you for the joy it is to be in this setting. Thank you, Lord, for each dear person that's here, each young person, each adult, God, each first-time guest and returning guest. Lord, each person that you have providentially and your plan allowed to gather in this setting, And Lord, I pray today that what would go forth would not be my words or my thoughts or someone else's words or thoughts, but it would be the clear testimony of Christmas, the the message, the anthem, the banner uh, level kind of communication that, God, you've entrusted to us through this chapter. And God, may we be like these shepherds and may we receive the message and may we share the message. May the testimony of Christmas be greater as a result of our time this morning. And we'll thank you and praise you for what's accomplished in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. I was in a fellowship meeting this last week and had a preacher who, uh, who was uh, speaking, and uh, he asked a question and answered the question that I had never heard before. Maybe you've heard this before. But any of you aware of, how many of you text message? Any of you do that? Raise your hand. All right. I've noticed the age bracket is going up. I was just talking with, I think it was Ms. Sheena was saying to her, her grandmother, Ms. Donna, that they now text. And she said that feels weird to her, texting with her grandmother. I've mentioned to you about that with my, my uh, not my mom yet, but my mother-in-law, we text now and then. And that feels a little weird, I got to be honest as well, especially when they start doing like LOL or some abbreviation. And you as the young guy don't know what they're saying, you know, you're not up to par. But I, the question was asked by this preacher, he said, uh, what was the first text message ever sent? What was the content of that text message? And I found it interesting. I had never heard this before. I don't know why I haven't, but back in 1992, uh, when it was still in the early phases of those uh, communication being developed before it went mainstream, the first text ever text was by a technician to a family member uh, on the cusp of just inventing this technology, and it had these two words, Merry Christmas. First text message ever sent, Merry Christmas. Can I just tell you today that there is a message that we find in this story that I think we lose sight of how glorious it is. 
And if we this morning would give you just two words that you could say, if we gave you just one sentence that you could communicate with everybody that defines who you are, that sets the whole tone of your current life and eternity, I hope that the message found in Luke chapter 2 would issue from your heart and from your lips. I think if we're not careful, we want to move on to new things or greater things so-called, when some of these principles, these foundational truths found early in this narrative are so crucial and so vital to who we are and what we know of our God. And if you were to outline the book of Luke, we've been looking at, we were in chapter one for the last couple of weeks, and now we are in chapter two. But if you were to outline Luke chapter two, this would be outlined in the, in the outline form as the announcement of Christmas. It is the public declaration of what an angel said in private to Mary, what an angel said in private to Zacharias, and based on Matthew's account, what the angel had told Matthew in private, or had told Joseph in private. And now you have the publication, you have this broadcasting of uh, this message. And so the question I would ask you this morning is, how does seeing the light of God's testimony enhance our appreciation of the Incarnation. How does seeing it be so public and so demonstrative, how does that help us appreciate more fully this thing we call Christmas? Well, this morning I want to look at two bright testimonies that are found here in Luke chapter 2 that go through to these shepherds and through these shepherds that I hope will enhance your appreciation for the broadcasting aspect, the testimony aspect of the Incarnation. First of all, number one, in verses 8 to 14, we have, first of all, a magnificent testimony. We have a magnificent testimony. Um, how many of you have ever been, uh, maybe you've walked out of your home or got out of a vehicle, or maybe you've driven outside of the city limits, you've gotten all the distractions aside, and you walk out into a clear night. Isn't it just beautiful? I think just last week, last, beginning of last week, we had a couple nights just crystal clear. And when you walk out and you look up into the sky, what do you see when you look up in that sky? You, you may see what? Stars, right? Uh, the moon. Um, moon was beautiful, I think, is the night I was thinking of. Um, you might see, if you're very fortunate, a comet go by or something like that, falling star. But how many of you have ever stepped out of your car, out of your house, or driven outside the city limits and looked up and seen angels? All right, if you have, I'd like to meet with you for counseling afterwards, after church today. <laughs> This is, a, this is a one-time kind of thing. This is an amazing thing that God, think about God commissioning these angels to go forth. And specifically, he tells them, go to a group of shepherds. You imagine the angel, would you mind going through that last part again? Go to what? To who? Shepherds? And declare this magnificent testimony. And I think it's the contrast, the disparity between the angels in the sky and these stinky, smelly shepherds that draws us even more into this story and this testimony of Christmas. And so the testimony of the angels emphasizes the elevation. It emphasizes the magnificence of the Christmas message. Notice a couple things about this message that makes it so glorious and so magnificent based on the record. Look, if you will, down at verse number 10. Luke chapter 2, if you will, and go back to verse number 10. All right, so the shepherds are abiding in the field. They're living there, watching their sheep. The angel appears to them, and notice what happens in verse number 10. First of all, it says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Number one, first of all, it's magnificent because it shines with magnificent celebration. This is a joyous thing. And specifically, first of all, number one, it is celebrated because of the news that's found in it. News that's found in it. Notice two things about this message that make it celebrated news, that make it breaking news, make it significant news. Notice it says in the, end, the middle of verse 10, Behold, I bring you good tidings. This is a message for our good. Um, you remember back in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, we just studied this morning in discipleship, where God looked at creation, what did He say? It was very what? Good. And since Genesis 1, verse 31, until the declaration in Luke chapter 2 and verse number 10, there hasn't been too much good, has there? And yet God says, I have good tidings. And the good tidings is a news that we must listen to and we must receive. But notice, secondly, he goes on to say, which shall be to all people. Not only is it for our good, but also it is for our globe. It is for all people. Uh, this last Sunday night, we had our teenagers uh, do minister during the service, did a great job. 
Um, and uh, despite their leader, Brother Dave, they did, no, I'm just kidding, he's the back, I pick on him. But Brother Dave was preaching on Sunday and did do a good job, by the way, just kind of balance out that criticism. So he was preaching, and I was sitting with my two boys. Heidi was in the nursery. And I, Pastor Dave was preaching, and I, I just underlined something in my Bible. In Landon, my son sitting to my right had never seen me do that before. And I think at first he's like, oh, you just wrote in your Bible, you know, that's, you're not supposed to do that. And so I just kind of leaned over and was explaining to him why dad was underlining that phrase and it was important. And I said, just whisper to him, I said, we don't underline just any verse, we underline special verses. And you can, my boy Landon, you can hear him think. Do you have a grandkid or a kid like that? You can hear their wheels just like turning and thinking, you can see their brain working. I wasn't that kid. You probably, that doesn't surprise you. But anyway, that, that's Lena. He was thinking. And all of a sudden, he nudged me and he said, you mean important verses like John 3.16? I said, yeah, like John 3.16. He flipped over and he underlined that verse. John 3.16 says, for God so loved what? The world. The world. See, this is not just good news that's for a special few or those that have a special perk or reward system in place with God. This is for all people. It is good news and it is globally significant. It is for all, all people. Now, if you will, go on to verse number 11. Notice the second aspect of this, this celebration. By the way, we live in a racially tensioned day, don't we? We have different ethnicities and different uh, social brackets all battling against one another. May I remind you, the Christmas message is not American. It's not just for a special group of people. It's for all people. It brings this goodwill. It brings this blessing. May we share that more consistently. Now look at you at verse 13. We'll come back to 11 and 12 in a moment. But notice the second aspect of why we should celebrate this testimony of Christmas. Verse 13. He says, and suddenly there was uh, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, now notice verse 14, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to men. Number two, the reason we also must celebrate is because of the purpose or the mission behind the message. And God's mission is revealed here in verse number 14 specifically. What is the two-part mission? First of all, you notice he says, glory to God in the highest. Here's a truth this morning. I hope you'll get this. Jesus did not come just to save us from our sins. He did do that. But his ultimate mission was what? To glorify God. It was glory to God in the highest. That's what makes it so amazing. That God comes into our world and into our darkness with His light so that He can be glorified. The lights of Luke are really about the Lord. They're not about Luke, and they're not about John, and they're not about even you and I. They're about the Lord. And so this purpose is to bring glory and honor to God. Now, if you've ever heard, there are a couple of different songs talking about a king would never be born the way Jesus was born. What a strange way to save the world. Different songs like that where artists have tried and, and songwriters have tried to capture how odd it is the way Jesus was given, how his salvation came. And if you don't understand that it's to bring praise and glory to God, you'll never understand the Christmas story. It's about him getting attention. It's about him doing something no one else could do in a way no one else could do it and redeem us in the process. Now, if you will, go on to the end of verse 14. So it is glory to God. It brings praise to God. But notice the end of verse 14. It says, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Number two, the purpose is peace toward men. Romans 10, 15, describing those who preach the gospel, says how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of what? Peace. It's a gospel of peace, not war, but peace. And I just encourage you this morning as you think on this celebration, we're celebrating a story as we just showed in video of a story that is not just God at a distance and not just these, these Jews at a distance. We are a part of the narrative. God wants to weave us into this great story and make our life and our heart and our future a part of its benefits and blessings. And so I just encourage you, make sure this is a time of celebration. I know there are lonely moments, there are discouraging moments, uh, this week we got news of several situations that of all the times for something to happen, difficult to happen during this season, and you feel for those people. And I feel for you if that's you this morning. But can I just remind you, spiritually speaking, we have something to celebrate, don't we? We have the Savior, and we know where He came and what His mission was. May we glory in that. Now, if you will, go back to verse 11, and notice the second aspect of this magnificent uh, revelation that God gives to these shepherds. Look, if you will, back at verse 11. He says, for unto you, 
is born this day, all right? So we're on the birth date, the exact day. We don't know that this was December 25th. I'm not gonna get into that discussion this morning for you academics. But anyway, this day, whatever day it was, notice, in the city of David, Bethlehem, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. For unto you is born this day. Number two, also, it is magnificent because of the communication found within it. What is being said? What is going to be accomplished by the birth of this baby? I was sharing this with our church folks um, on Wednesday night. Um, Last Sunday afternoon, yours truly, who is so gifted and so smooth and so coordinated, uh, we got into our car and I was telling, any of you men have a a, a dear wife who always is running on E, and when you get in, you gotta go fill up the tank. I I have that kind of wife, I love my wife. And so Sunday we got into uh, her vehicle to drive home, and it's on E, and so I decided to swing by and get gas. And so I, as I was turning on three, right there in Crest on the south south side, turning into the gas station, I accidentally hit the horn as I'm pulling into the gas station. I mean, not just a beep, it's a wah, you know, before I, kind of, what is it? So I I hit the horn as I'm pulling in and every station is full except the one I'm pulling into. Everybody's just looking at me, you know? And then what was worse was, the guy in front of me in the bay I was in is my neighbor. And he he just looked at me, you know, like, what is your problem? You know, he, he didn't know if he wanted to associate with me in that moment. And so that, yes, last Sunday afternoon, if you remember, the Buckeyes just found out that they got in the, the, the championship, the new format for college football. So I said something about, hey, how about those Buckeyes? And he kind of just, again, man, you're a little too pumped here, you know, a little too excited. And he hasn't talked to me since now that I think about it. It's my neighbor. But anyway, we had that moment of, it's just good news. I don't know what the news was, but man, it was worth getting excited about. Do we this morning absorb, do we apply, do we appreciate how much is found here in the person of Jesus Christ. And notice what is said about him. And I give you just a couple things in this area. First of all, notice that there's a communication of identity. Verse 11 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, a Savior which is Christ the Lord. And that word Christ that is found there is the same word parallel with the Old Testament term Messiah. This is the deliverer. This is the anointed one. This is the one that has been promised. And today, this moment, while you were watching sheep and moving sheep and sleeping and dwelling in fields, God fulfilled this promise on this day. And the identification is revealed. Hold your place there in Luke very quickly. Would you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 8? And I just want to remind you that there's only one person like the baby born, like our Savior, And 1 Corinthians chapter 8 stresses the singularness or the significance exclusively of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 6. Babies are born every day, aren't they? Amazing births, miraculous births, things that God does in individual families. But there was only one that could be born that fits the description found in this verse. Look if you will at 1 Corinthians chapter number 8 and verse 6. But to us, a uh, previous verse talks about there are so-called gods, plural, small g. Notice verse 6, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in Him. Notice now the end of this verse, in one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. I think if we are not careful, we forget how singular how significant Jesus Christ is, and there's no one else that can compare to him. Um, Often we use comparative language to describe something. It was like this. It was was like back, remember when we used to do this, or we had this, or we experienced this? There's no like with the Lord. Have you ever thought about that? He just is who he is. He's self-existent. He's self-sufficient, and there's nothing even to compare to him. And there is a, a magnificent communication when God says through these angels, this is He. This is the only one. This is Christ the Lord. And there is only one Lord that we must submit to. And so to properly represent Christmas, for us to get the message out that we're going to get to in just a moment, we have to first of all recognize who it's all about. Recognize Him for being what God described Him to be in verse number 11. Now, if you will, go back to our text here in uh, Luke 2, and notice now verse 12. And notice the second communication that is given. So here is who he is. He's been born. 
And then I find this interesting, verse 12. Look at it. It says this, And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Number two, not only did God give to them the identification of this baby, but also the signage needed to find him. The, the signage, this fact that there was a babe lying in a manger, and when you see him, that's who I just described to you in verse number 11. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Think about that. God himself giving us a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God wants us to find him. God's not playing hide and seek with you this morning and trying to in some way deceive you or mislead you. He wants you to find the manger. He wants you to find the cross. He wants you to find he who is to be your Savior. I've had people ask me before, have you ever heard this question? Why would a loving God send people to hell? Have you ever heard that question? I heard a preacher, in fact, a preacher I served under in the last church I was at, say this, no, God doesn't send people to hell. Your sins do. In fact, the only way you get to hell is by climbing over the cross, by ignoring the revelation, His Word, His Spirit, creation. It's all around you. God doesn't want you to miss who Jesus is. And this morning, God cares enough about you to show you uh, not just who He is, but where to find Him and how to have personal relationship with Him. There was a, a sad story that I read in the news on Friday. It took place in a, uh, in a uh, city of California, Brother Josh may know, Castaic, I believe is how you say it. And the story was of a man who had his two children who were primary age, elementary age children in his car. He was going through divorce proceedings with his, his wife, soon to be ex-wife and uh, was supposedly, after the fact, had just realized he had lost custody of his children. He's losing his wife, going through some other challenges physically and financially. And the gentleman, he just got the news. He's driving down the road, has his two kids in the back, and he looks off to the right and sees a rest area, the big old semi sitting there, takes his car and just slams it into that, into that tractor trailer killing all three of them instantly. And they said he didn't even hit the brakes. He was accelerating as he hit that truck. He lost all hope and took his kids with him. You know that we have a message today that pushes back the darkness and despair. It's a message worth celebrating today. Maybe the reason the world isn't listening to our message is we're bored with it. We think there's more than one option. But we don't act as if what we have exclusively offers hope. Sometimes we've forgotten what it says, what God has declared through the incarnation. We're not speaking up as we should. Listen, the sign of Jesus Christ and the, the speech connected with Jesus Christ moves us from self-destructing and it communicates a magnificent, a move the angels into the heavens kind of testimony. Does it move us today? Or does it motivate us to share this message with others? Now that leads us to our second point. If you will now go back to our text and look at verse 15. And I find it interesting to see the response of these shepherds. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go. Let us now go even unto Bethlehem. Number two, not only is this testimony something that's magnificent, but number two, it is a moving, it is a moving testimony. There was an article in the news the other day, retailers are worried because Thanksgiving came so late this year. I don't know if you realize or not, but Thanksgiving is always, what, the fourth Thursday of the month and the way it fell this year. Thanksgiving, I think, technically, could it be one day later? Maybe, but it was the 27th. Um, and so they're worried that there's only some, there's less days between Black Friday and Christmas, and therefore it's going to hurt us economically. And amazing the things we get absorbed with. That article went on to say that the Christmas spending for this year would average out to $85 per person globally. And you all know there are folks not spending that for Christmas that some of us are making up for. We're so consumed with ourselves. Christmas is not about us. It's not about sitting down or squatting down with our little hunk of whatever. It's about us moving and about us being what God would have us to be. So the first aspect would be the elevation of the story. This news, it's elevated by the angels. But the second half is the effect of it. What should it do to us when we hear this message, when we fully absorb what God has communicated to us? By the way, before we get into specifics, these shepherds were like the lowest rung of the social uh, ladder in their culture. Um, for one thing, they work with sheep, and that was not necessarily the most high-profile career. 
Number two, because they did that, they were ceremonially unclean. They couldn't go into certain sections of the temple. They were outcast, and I find it interesting that God went to them and drew them into a relationship with Him. Now, a couple of things about this testimony that are moving. First of all, number one, you see the pursuit of these men. You see the moving pursuit of these men. First of all, number one, you notice that there is a pursuing, uh, a pursuit of urgency. If you notice in verse 15, they say, the beginning of the verse, after they hear it, they said one to another, let us now go. And then he noticed in verse 16, and they came with what? Haste. There was an urgency uh, to their response. And the phrase there you find, even unto Bethlehem. We don't know exactly where these men were located, but I, will, I would say that that phrase seems to indicate they were at some distance. And they were willing to travel. They were willing to commit to pursuing and following what God had revealed to them. Now we have time to look at it, but in Matthew chapter 2, it describes another group of people who should have known better. Herod, the scribes, and the priests, they got word. Remember the wise men come and they say, where is he that is born king of the Jews? They look in Scripture and they find out it's Bethlehem. And what do they do? They stay there. They're just a few miles away, and yet they're unwilling to travel that distance. These men, these shepherds, in contrast, were willing to pursue. Not tomorrow, not next week, but today. He was born today. I want to see him today. I want to see what God has promised. I remind you in Scripture, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Where's the urgency? If you're unsaved this morning, you have no guarantee of tomorrow, the next 10 minutes. Today, to, right now is the moment for you to receive Christ. If today's the day of salvation for those that are lost, is it not also moving to us as believers? That means today I need to witness, I need to jot that Christmas card, not a holiday card, but a Christmas card. I need to share that verse, I need to be a testimony. There ought to be urgency during this Christmas season. Notice the second aspect of their response in this pursuit. Go back to verse 15, the end of the verse. And to see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath, notice, made known unto us. Skip down to the end of verse 16. And found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Number two, there was personal, or there was a pursuit of discovery. They wanted to discover. They wanted to know. They wanted to be personally involved in what God had revealed to them. See, the shepherds went to see the baby. They, they, they committed. They followed through in what God had revealed to them. And I find it interesting at the end of verse 16, they recognized that what they saw in the sky was the Word of God, what the Lord has revealed to us. And so they responded by faith. They, they wanted to see with their eyes what God had promised. And in verse 16 where it says, and found, has the idea of discovery after pursuit. It, they had to search, they had to look, they had to follow the clues that God had given. Real quickly, would you go back to the book of Romans? I think we have time to look at this. Romans chapter number 3. And just for a moment, may I remind you that none of us seek God. Ultimately, it is Him seeking us. And this passage speaks to that. Romans chapter 3, and if you would please, let's begin in verse number 10. Have you ever thought about the fact that without God revealing Himself to you, you would have never found Him? I, I, have, I have no ability to find God. I can't poke Him. I can't see Him. I can't follow Him. It's only because He's pursuing me and He reveals Himself to me that I know anything about Him. That will move us today. And notice, if you will, here in Romans 3, this principle. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. So don't look down at these shepherds and say, well, I'd have been a little more sophisticated or a little more discerning. Go, if you will, now down to verse number 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Remember, we've been talking about God didn't want us to miss it. He kept prophesying. He is coming. He is coming. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of, Christ, of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all that believe, for there's no difference. Verse 23, for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so God is the one who's initiated with us, right? We didn't seek Him, He sought us. And it is our responsibility to respond to that and, and allow God's revelation to be believed. What is our response? We just believe. We just receive what God has done and what God has revealed. 
To discover a God who came near requires our seeking Him through the Word of God and through what the Holy Spirit reveals to us. Now let's spend a few minutes at the end of this story. Go, if you will, back to Luke 2. And I love how this story uh, ends with these last few verses. Luke chapter 2, and if you will now, verse 17. So there's a moving uh, pursuit, and you see these men moving. They didn't stay stagnant. Um, Here's the point before we move on. If you're the same today, if you read your Bible the same amount of time, if you pray the same, if there's just kind of a routine to your walk with God and it's the same as it was last Christmas, you don't get the message of Christmas. You ought to be on fire for God. You ought to be passionate today. And you ought to be more so next Christmas than this Christmas. Because He did something in your heart. He's moving in your life. And you want that. It, It moves you to discover and believe more. Now, go if you will here to verse 17. Notice the second aspect of this moving. And when they had seen it, I don't know what you would have done or I would have done, but notice what they did. They made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Number two, not only was it moving in the area of pursuit, they were moved to pursue, but number two, they were moved to publicize, to proclaim what God had revealed to them. The other day we got in the mail a uh, catalog, a publication, if you will. Um, and it was, have you ever got a publication, maybe even buy clothes from the, clothing from them, L.L. Bean, have you ever heard of that? Some of the other day described L.L. Bean catalogs. They said it's a catalog for people, quote, who like, it's outdoor clothing for people who don't like to be outdoors. <laughs> That's their purpose. That's their publication. Um, the message we're talking about, this publicizing, it, it got out. And it got out largely not because of the angels, but because of these shepherds. Uh, and so God wants to use us to be a part of that message, broadcasting, getting outdoors, if you will, out of this room, out of our homes, this message, that others might hear it and receive it. And those two things about this public, uh, publicizing that took place. Number one, first of all, they publicized the revelation that God had given. Did you notice that in verse 17? They made known abroad the saying, not the sight, not the feelings, but notice what they publicized, the saying which was told them concerning this child. And so they communicated the Word of God. That was their ally. That was their verbalization. Many of us in our witness and testimony, let me just tell you what I feel about God or what I've experienced about God. That may have its place, but is it biblical? Are we sharing the Word that's quick and powerful and convicts and encourages and draws others to Him? And so the Word of God needs to be what we're publicizing. If you're not reading it, if you're not memorizing, if you're not studying it, if you're not meditating upon it, how are you ever going to get it out when it's not in here and in here in your own life? But we need to work at this. Let the Christmas story not just get in us, but get out of us for the glory of God. Now, notice what happens because of this publicizing of the revelation. Notice verse 18. And all they that heard it wondered, notice that, wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Basically, maybe they didn't say this word in Jewry or in Israel, but basically when they would hear the news, one word kept coming up, was at least the feel. Wow. Wow. If you were to read through Luke, there's a lot of wows in the Christmas story. They were amazed at this. They wondered at this. They were amazed by this and this and this of the story. Can I ask you this morning, where's the wow in your witness? Why, when you share Christ and when you live out what God's doing in your life, why don't others respond the way the crowd responded to these stinky, smelly shepherds in the middle of the night, causing a ruckus and rejoicing at what God had revealed to them? Can I give you two things I believe that weaken our witness as you pray on how to be a testimony this season? First of all, one, I th- number one, I think the reason we're missing the wow in our witness is there's too much of us. Too much of us in our testimony. These shepherds had nothing to brag about. In fact, most of the social classes they were interacting with wanted nothing to do with them. And yet they still said, wow, because it wasn't about them. It wasn't about what they knew or what they, uh, again, in and of themselves could offer. Can I give you a couple things about too much of us that I think hinder our witness? Just give you a few ideas, our shyness. A shyness, in reality, is selfishness. Why why are we shy? We're worried what everybody else is thinking of us. That's self-focused. We need to get rid of that. Number two, rudeness. I think sometimes our testimony is rude. 
Number three, pride. That's a big one, isn't it? Pride brings contention. And often our pride separates our kids, separates our teenagers, separates our neighbors, separates our coworkers, because they see it in us, and they're not able to see Jesus Christ. Uh, number four, fear. That's a big one. Over and over in the Christmas story, fear not, and then God's news is given. And number five, ignorance. Those five things, I believe too much of that is in us. As a result, others don't hear of our testimony. Second Corinthians 4, 5, Paul said, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Is it about you? If it is, your testimony will not be what it should be for the Lord. Second, number two, I believe also there's too little of Jesus in our witness. That's why we don't see a wow. We don't see openness and responsiveness to the testimony of Jesus Christ. There's too little of Jesus. And I give you just a few things I think we need to make more of when it comes to Jesus. Love, His love. More love. More love needs to be communicated in our lips and hearts and homes. Number two, His truth. His truth. Number three, His grace. Number four, His mercy. Number five, His forgiveness. Number six, His hope. And number seven, His light. And the list could go on and on and on. Those are things that ought to be regularly a part of our testimony. And if others are not moved as they were by this testimony, maybe we need to add a little bit more of that in our lives. Where is the written and living word in your witness? Are you being faithful to it? Now, we'll get to the last couple of thoughts in just a moment, but can I give you a statement? If you're taking notes, would you jot down this statement? This kind of was the catalyst for this section of our study that I read several months ago that has challenged me in my own testimony and witness for the Lord. Would you jot down this statement? It's by a gentleman named Samuel Shoemaker. Here's the quote. Most people, most people are brought to faith in Christ. All right, jot this down. Most people are brought to faith in Christ not by argument for it, but by exposure to it. Most people are brought to faith in Christ not by argument for it, but by exposure to it. And if it gets in us, and it's real, and it's exciting, and it's dynamic, it will move others. Most people are brought to faith in Christ not by argument for it, but by exposure to it. When others rub up against you this season, will they get exposed to it? Will it just come out? And will others sense it and see it and respond to it? Not that we don't speak. Many times we're arguing or we've yet to internalize what God has done. Now lastly, if you will, let's spend a few minutes in verse 20. In verse number 20, after describing Mary pondering these things and thinking on these things in her heart, which, by the way, tonight we're going to be talking about how, to, how we should respond to the season of Christmas and practical things, and one of them is thinking on it, as we see Mary doing in verse 19. Go, if you will, now to verse 20. And the shepherds returned, where? To their sheep, to their fields, to their homes, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Number two, and lastly, there's a publicized worship. There's a publicized worship. We don't know that anyone else saw what was said by the angel or by the host of angels, but everybody saw and heard what was said and sung and worshiped by these shepherds. There was a public worship. And where there had been angels worshiping God, there are now shepherds worshiping God. They took the place, think of that, by the grace of God, shepherds replace the angels. To me, that gives me hope that I can be a part of bringing glory and honor to God. If God can use these men, God can use me to be a part of bringing praise and glory and worship to the Lord. Are you willing this morning to go back home? Are you willing to go back to your family this week, the next few weeks as you gather and just praise God and just worship Him publicly and let them know not how great and good you are and what a great worshiper you are, <laughs> Let them know how great the God is you're worshiping. Elevate Him. But go back where you've been. Go back to those that you've maybe not celebrated Christmas as well as you should have in the past. Make much of Jesus. Let Him be who He should be. Now let's finish this morning by going to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And may I bring this to application in the church age, and specifically to our church today. 
1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And this idea of testimony was not just relegated to shepherds or just to the first few generations of those removed from the birth of Christ that's been entrusted to us as the church. And notice these words found in verse 15 of 1 Timothy 3. But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Notice this, the pillar and ground of the truth. And then you have this description of what our truth is, what our message is. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That's our testimony. It's a true testimony. It's a mysterious testimony. But when empowered with the Holy Spirit and when built upon the Word of God, it makes a difference in the hearts and lives of others. One of the saddest stories or pictures I've seen recently was a satellite photo of the Korean Peninsula. Um, most of you are aware there's been years and years of political unrest and battles and things going on. And now, currently, that peninsula is divided into two sections, right? Two separate indigenous countries, South Korea, which is democratic and at least somewhat free and works in coordination with our country and allies. And then North Korea, ruled by a dictator, brutal dictator, and the people are oppressed. But what was sad about this, the picture was this, with all that backstory is from space, if you take a picture of the peninsula, uh, the Korean peninsula at night, it is mind boggling the difference between the southern half and the top half. You look at the south half, like most, most areas of development, there's lights, there's, there, which represents uh, you know, industry, represents development. And you can tell even from space where that line is, and it is just darkness the top half of that peninsula. Can I ask you this morning, where's the top half? Where's the North Korea in your life that is yet to hear of this news that wasn't just for you and me that maybe do live in the precincts of the lights that we need to be more faithful in our witness and we need to be amazed by it and just can't hold on to it. We have to share it. We have to speak it to make sure that the Christmas story has a testimony through our life and through our lips. As we finish this morning, may I ask you this question? I want you to think about this and will you be willing to respond? Will you allow God to brighten your Christmas with his magnificent testimony? Will you allow him to brighten your Christmas with a moving testimony that gives you purpose, gives you something to talk about, gives you something to share, gives you a burden that translates to, again, this word, testimony? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight, or this morning. Thank you for the privilege it is to preach it.